my talk is really about tactile sensing and how can we be build better sensors for, uh, for a variety of different applications. So let's look at typical tactile say, sensing scenario. You know, we have an object, uh, you know, we, have, we are trying to grasp the given object, and essentially our tactile, tactile uh, sensors in our hand sort of give us, sort of capture this information and they give us some feedback how we should basically be interacting with these objects. So basically we have tons of sensors in our hand and basically what we are getting here is, is very dense inter, uh, tactile information from the sensors. Today in HCI, if you look at the different types of sensors, they are kind of bulky, not exactly usable. Uh, so this is the, the current state of the art. Uh, in robotics, there's tons of different uh, uh, ways of, of effectively uh, trying to, to perform the grasping. So for example, vision-based techniques are extremely uh, important and, and they are very prominent today. You know, lots of uh, uh, 3D sensors, cameras that are t typically captured and, and cap, uh, that are coupled with current uh, uh, robotic systems to essentially to guide, guide these robotic systems. There are also a number of mechanical sensors that essentially uh, allow you to, uh, to capture the information. Typically, the, the sensor resolution is relatively limited in these cases. And then we also have the recent wave of, of, uh, of optical sensors. These are, you are going to see that uh, talk about this later, uh, later this afternoon. Uh, so this is also a very interesting uh, te uh, technology that emerges sort of in this field. Okay, so what, how, do we, uh, how our group tries to improve tactile sensing? So we have essentially uh, came up with a new touch sensors and, and we, we, uh, we are striving to deliver the following three uh, components. Uh, so first, the sensors needs to be high, uh, high density. Uh, the second one, the, the sensor, uh, in our, in our uh, opinion, should be flexible and stretchable, so it can be essentially applied to different types of uh, surfaces. And then finally, it should be robust and durable, so basically it should uh, work in the field for extended periods of time. So these are the properties of the sensors that we would like to have. Oh, so this is essentially how the sensor that we have built uh, looks like. We have tried many, many different things, you know, and, and this is sort of what we have converged on. So in general, you know, this, as you can see, this, this, this particular incarnation has 32 by 32 resolution. It's flexible, it's stretchable, and basically it allows you to measure the information for, for, for extended periods of time. So essentially what you are going to see if, from this kind of sensor is this, this type of um, a map. So for example, if you apply the sensor to a human hand, uh, you will see that, you know, the, the areas that have uh, larger uh, these sort of colors or larger circles that correspond to, to larger forces, the areas that are sort of white, that means essentially that, uh, that, that there are little, there's little force essentially applied to these areas. So how is this uh, type of sensor built? Uh, well, basically it's very, very simple. Uh, you effectively use a piezo-resistive film that is inserted in between two different uh, uh, types of, uh, two different electrodes, uh, uh, conductive electrodes, and there is some protective cover on each. So the architecture is embarrassingly simple that you have here and can be really uh, 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 built from almost off-the-shelf components. You know, this type of sensor can be built for uh, less than $10. So this is really widely accessible. You can really start using it and building it. So this is how this, this sensor looks like. This is the data capture from the sensor. As you can see, it's, it's highly flexible. Uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can really, uh, it captures the data uh, through, through the set of wires. That, so, so, so building a, a proper connector in this case, of course, uh, was uh, a quite of, uh, pretty, uh, pretty challenging. But in, in, gen, in, in general, sort of if you try to sort of, uh, look at this type of uh, capture scenario, this is the sensor mounted on a human hand. It, and in this case, the, per, the person is folding a paper plane. Over there, what is really, I think, the most in interesting is sort of, uh, in, this, in the corner, it's, it shows you the readout from the sensor. So in general, you can see as the, as the person is, sort of, is manipulating with this object, you have this vast amount of data, tactile data, that's, that's, that's being captured. 
Okay, so uh, we also have looked at a number of dif these different properties. We have very carefully evaluated the performance of this type of sensor. Uh, this, this concerns uh, the forces from roughly 30 millinewtons to 0 0.5 newtons, so this is a pretty good range. Uh, we typically repeat uh, we, uh, the, the sensor uh, over uh, thousands of cycles, so, and so it's, it's, the, the repetitions and the, and, the, and the performance doesn't degrade, and it has a pretty wide operating temperature, essentially up to 80 uh, C. So this is a pretty wide, wide uh, range of uh, temperatures over which the sensor can operate. We have also worked, looked at the exotic des uh, designs of these sensors. What does exotic mean? It's basically, you can sort of cut holes within the given sheet, and in this case, the sensor can be sort of stretchable uh, and easily stretch uh, can be stretchable, and basically the performance stays still stays the same. Uh, so this is how this sort of looks like if you, uh, if you, if you cut out these sort of small auxetic uh, uh, structures. And this, is sort of, uh, this sort of shows you that as even if, if you, can sort of, if you uh, uh, pull on different sort of corners of this sensor array, that it still captures the, the, the quality of the data fairly well. Uh, so the summary so far. We have a pressure sensor uh, that can be essentially that is very inexpensive, very robust, operates over a wide range of uh, temperatures, and basically we can apply this type of uh, uh, human, uh, this type of sensors to human hands and different types of robotic grippers. Uh, so the question is, you know, can we, if we have this type of uh, sensors, can we start combining it with modern machine learning techniques? So we are going to show you a few different sort of applications. You know, obviously, we, I'll show you that we can combine with machine learning, modern machine learning techniques. Uh, so uh, I would like to show you sort of this on relatively simple tasks. Uh, so uh, we would like to apply it to understanding how human grasps of objects. So first of all, you know, uh, people can really perform simple tasks uh, like, uh, and, and, and the, uh, like, for example, classifications of the objects. Or, uh, or estimating weight of the objects, and 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 we can do it just on the on the on the touch uh, sense, sensing alone. So so I'm going to show you sort of uh, that using modern machine learning uh, methods, we can build computational models that basically are, are, are can uh, can essentially perform these tasks almost equally well. So first of all, we have uh, built a uh, very big data sets. So in this case, we have captured, we have uh, identified 26 different objects and uh, uh, people were interacting with these objects uh, and effectively we have captured 130 thousands of tactile frames for, uh, uh, for all of these uh, object interactions. So this is how the typical interaction session looks like. As you can see, uh, the uh, participant is instructed to uh, basically manipulate with the objects, touch it from different uh, sides, and sort of uh, uh, perform typical tasks with, with this, uh, with this uh, object type. Uh, as you can see, kind of in a close-up, this is a very, very rich uh, way of representing data. You can sort of see, you know, uh, the the, uh, the pressure maps directly, you know, captured as as the person uh, is manipulating with the object. Uh, so, what is the touch data representation here? Well, basically, we have sort of, as you can sort of think of this as almost having an, an array of, a two-dimensional two array of data. So, basically, sensors locations are approximated on a 2D grid. Uh, and effectively, it almost looks like an image, right? So uh, in the areas where you have data, you have basically, you, you, uh, uh, you can sort of essentially uh, uh, put it on a two-dimensional grid. And you can almost think of this as a two-dimensional image of all of the tactile information. Uh, and in this case, unused pixels essentially are set at two to zero values. So how, what, how, how are we going essentially to look at this type of data? We are going to use a modern uh, uh, neural network architecture. So this is a ResNet architecture that we have uh, applied to this type of uh, data. Uh, and uh, multiple frames in this case are treated as sort of multiple sort of inputs to, this, to the systems. And then the output from this system essentially is a classification vector that tells us uh, which type of objects we have interacted with. So the input is just the tactile information, uh, these pressure maps, and the output is what type of objects we are interacting. So and then essentially you get this kind of classification vector that tells you, and the highest value in this vector tells you uh, which object it is. So let's look at some of the results. So this is so this is a typical. The input would be some one of these uh, uh, would be some of these images, 
and the output in this case would be this vector that tells you what, which type of object we have interacted with. So if you look at this type of data, this neural network is going to tell you correctly in this case that we have interacted with the mug. Uh, so this is the correct object. Uh, if you look at another type of uh, frame, in this case, the, this, the mark is sort of is slightly lower, but still pretty high, but slightly lower, but you can sort of see th so that this is the correct object. Uh, but there are two other objects that are predicted higher. In this case, these are the coke cans. So it's not really, you know, the, the basically the object, this, this, this neural network architecture does things reasonably well. Basically, it tries to predict very similar objects in this case. In this case. What happens when we extend it to multiple frames? Well, it works better, basically. Uh, you, you extend these architectures where more, more frames are fed to this, this type of neural system. And this just shows you that, that uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you apply a larger number of frames, these attached uh, frames, the, the classification accuracy goes uh, is higher. And this sort of black uh, curve shows you just, you know, if you are, uh, if the, the object is, the, is essentially the best, ob this is the correct object. The red curve in this case shows you whether the, the, ob the correct object is within the best three predictors that we have, uh, that we have, uh, that the net neural network has, has essentially uh, told you. So let's look at another sort of uh, 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 example here. So in this case, this is weight estimation problem. Same type of data. The, uh, uh, the person is sort of interacting with the objects. And the in this case, neural network is supposed to tell you what, uh, how, what is the actual, the, what's the weight of, the, of, this, of this object. So again, we have, uh, we have worked with, 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 we have trained this data. Uh, we, we have trained the neural network on this, on this data, and as you can see, the, in, uh, this, in, in this case, the network uh, predicts the performance uh, or predicts the weight of the objects more accurately than just summing over the, all of the forces, and it's reasonably good uh, compared to the ground truth. What is also very interesting is, is, uh, this, is this is another extension of this work, is actually look at uh, what the network is actually learning. So typically in computer vision tasks, people sort of have sort of, uh, when, they, uh, when they train these networks, essentially the networks, the lower levels of uh, layers of these net networks uh, learn special types of uh, filters. So, and these uh, filters are pretty much learned completely automatically. In this case, we, con we started with completely blank slate, and we wanted to figure out what do these, uh, what do uh, t pressure maps that we captured, you know, essentially, and, and the corresponding networks, what do, what kind of filters do they learn? As you can see, you know, the the let the these, uh, the, uh, the features that are learned from this data is are quite similar to what uh, typical. Uh, networks for visual classifications, uh, uh, capture and soft learn. So this is actually a very interesting finding. There are some small discrepancies between those as well. So the, the other sort of interesting questions are what is in the data? So what, is, uh, what, is, uh, what, what happens here is that when you capture pressure maps, you really in fact have a mixture of different forces. So one of them is basically object hand interactions. The other one is essentially uh, uh, ob object, the object signature, right? Uh, so, so this object inter interaction tells you the, the object signature, and there's also hand hand interaction. So, so hand basically the, the hand the, set, the 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 pose of this of uh, that you uh, the current pose tells you something uh, is, is embedded here in this data. So, basically, for each type of frame, you also have a given. Uh, hand pose signature. So the question here is, can we somehow uh, decode the, this data? So in this case, as you can see, depending on, on the uh, pose of your hand, you will see that the response of the sensor is slightly different. And what we do in this case, we are trying to uh, decouple these two types of uh, the data, the, we, to these type of uh, information streams. It basically, the way to do this is to just look at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, uh, at the time of, of the captures, and we can, in this case, uh, see, uh, uh, we, in this case, we can see that we can observe the whole stream and, uh, of the data, temporal stream of the data, which tells you 
uh, the data just before the object was grasped and after the object was grasped. So in these cases, the pose really doesn't change, and the only thing that sort of changes is whether the object was grasped by the given up hand. As you can see, we can, in this case, decouple these two uh, data streams and essentially almost subtract the hand pose in, in these cases. What, what is also interesting in this data is, is uh, sensor correlation. So if you sort of analyze all of these uh, data streams of interacting with different types of objects, you will see that different areas of the hands are pretty correlated. And this is sort of embedded directly in the data. So we can run the analysis that tells you if you essentially attaching, if we are working with a given part of the hand, what are the other uh, areas of the hand that sort of also uh, high, uh, uh, help you there? So, for example, uh, if you sort of highlight on the sort of uh, uh, fingertips, you will see that area, other areas of the hand also help you uh, sort of when you perform complicated tasks. So these are the other sort of areas. So whenever you are touching something with, the, with this type of uh, uh, with the tips, you, the, the green areas tell you what are the other sort of uh, sensors that typically, uh, in this case, help you in this case. All right, so uh, I would like to sort of summarize this talk. Uh, so we, I have shown you how to build uh, high resolution tactile sensing that is inexpensive, that is robust, and operates uh, over a wide range of different conditions. Uh, I also showed you how to build a machine learning workflow to utilize this data. And we believe that these uh, new types of uh, uh, hardware and software opens many new uh, different applications, op applications HCI, robotics, prosthetics, AR, and VR. I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the colleagues that help us in this project and participated, of course, in this project. And I also would like to acknowledge the support from National Science Foundation and from Toyota Research Institute. Thank you, and this is the website where you can access all of the data about the project.